Welcome everyone. I'm Whitney Keyes, the Executive Director of Seattle City Club, and I want to thank you for joining us for this virtual Civic Cocktail program. Before it begins, I need to recognize the Seattle Channel as our longtime media partner and Town Hall as our nonprofit program partner. Town Hall's inspiring programs create an engaged community and ensure that everyone has a voice. Our Civic Cocktail program wouldn't be possible without the generous support of Comcast, our presenting sponsor. For decades, Seattle City Club has been working to connect, inform, and engage people around civic issues to help strengthen our region. And we create opportunities for diverse perspectives and different voices to come together in respectful, thoughtful ways. You can be a part of this conversation during this program by submitting your questions to the chat box. They may not all be answered, but every idea is valued. Seattle City Club is hosting a few other programs that you might find interesting. On October 9th at 1 p.m., we're facilitating a virtual civic boot camp, and the topic is on racial equity and systemic racism. And then on October 7th and the 22nd, as part of the Washington State Debate Coalition, we are hosting free virtual debates for the gubernatorial and the lieutenant governor races across our state. These are gonna be broadcast by our media partners, so we'll make access available for everyone. These programs and more information can be found on our website at seattlecityclub.org or the website wadebates.org. Behind the scenes, nonprofits like Town Hall and Seattle City Club work very hard to put on this type of programming. And it takes a lot of work. And so during and immediately following the program, you can donate online or you can text to give. And what you need to do for that is to text the word civics to the number 44. Three, two, one. Whatever you give will be split between our two organizations, and I just want to thank you in advance for your support. So, are you ready? Because now it's that time to grab the drink of your choice, sit back and relax, as we welcome our host, Joni Balter, and get started with our Civic Cocktail Program. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter, and we really do have a great show tonight. We start with the change on the US Supreme Court and its possible impacts on Washington State. Our guests this evening are Senior US District Judge Robert Lasnick and State Senator Monka Dingra from Washington's 45th District from Redmond. I am so happy to be here with you both, virtually anyway. Uh, real quickly, Judge Lasnik, we will get to our actual topic in a second, but uh, the president just got out of Walter Reed Hospital. He's not out of the woods, however, yet. Can you, as a student of history, remind us how succession works if a president becomes incapacitated? Thanks, Joni. The 25th Amendment uh, allows for a president who cannot perform his duties uh, temporarily to uh, designate that he's uh, unavailable to be president temporarily and the vice president takes over. If the vice president is also unavailable, then it, there's a line of succession in a bill passed by Congress and the 25th amendment contemplates that Congress would do that. And right now it's the secretary of state after the vice president excuse me, the Speaker of the House after the Vice President and the President pro tem of the Senate, then the Secretary of State and the Cabinet members. Now, there's at least a little bit of an argument about whether that law is constitutional or whether the Constitution requires only executive branch officers to be in the line of succession, not congressional officers. But we'll leave that for another day. Uh, we will. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Dingra, the pie is almost baked. That is to say, Amy Coney Barrett presumably uh, will be confirmed by the U.S. Senate in the next few months. How uh, does the change on the court affect Washington State? You know, Joni, uh, and thank you, first of all. Um, uh, thank it's you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm very concerned about what this does mean for health care access for uh, Washingtonians. Uh, I will say that we have done a lot in Washington to protect individuals here. Reproductive health, uh, voting rights, 
And as we know, when voting rights and especially redistricting get impacted, it impacts, you know, a lot of issues around who can vote, when they can vote, and, you know, how do we exist as a representative democracy? If a woman's right to choose somehow becomes a state by state decision, where will that leave uh, pro-choice women in Washington state? So specifically, we've taken a, a lot of votes in our state on this topic. We have, and I will say that um, I will be so super glad to be living in Washington if or when um, Roe versus Wade is struck down. You know, over and over again, Washingtonians have said that it is very important to protect a woman's right to choose. We have voted on this multiple times um, as uh, citizens, but in 2018 in the state of Washington, we actually passed a Reproductive Parity Act and I was very glad to vote for that, which actually requires all health plans to cover contraception without any cost sharing and requires all plans that cover maternity care to also cover all reproductive health options, including abortions. So it really makes it clear that the woman has the ability to make uh, choices about her health and not be subject to what is going on with her employer or healthcare provider. And then Judging. last, oh, oh, I was just gonna say last year, we also did the Reproductive Health Access for All Act, which actually makes sure that we cannot discriminate on the basis of gender identity. And so reproductive health for transgender people is also protected in the state of Washington. Judge Lasnick, when you and I were prepping for this show, we were talking and you, you told me a story about the late Justice Ginsburg, her legal uh, take on the choice matter. It's something people might not know that well. Right, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was critical of the legal reasoning in Roe versus Wade. And she was actually opposed, her nomination was opposed by women's groups, uh, partially because of that. But she felt that um, that women were making great progress in the legislative arena, such as Washington State, and uh, that the uh, decision to find a privacy right not mentioned in the Constitution left the uh, Roe versus Wade subject to later attack in a way it would not have been had it been focused more on equal protection for women mm -hmm. uh, and the control over their economic future and their uh, reproductive health. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who didn't agree with that. Now, there were a lot of people who criticized Thurgood Marshall when he was a lawyer also for not being radical enough on civil rights. But in the rearview mirror, they both seem like giants, both as attorneys and Supreme Court justices. Uh, Judge Lesnick, the de death of Justice Ginsburg has brought out a little rascal you, you might say in both political parties, Democrats are talking about term limiting Supreme Court justices or even adding justices to the court. What do you think of these kinds of structural changes? Maybe you'll take them one at a time or both together. Well, I think that uh, we do have a history uh, in this country of um, changing the number of justices on the US Supreme Court. Originally it was six uh, that's because there were three circuits and they needed two justices per circuit. And in those days, the, there were no circuit court judges like there are now. There was a district judge who sat with two Supreme Court justices and that constituted the circuit. And literally the Supreme Court justices would ride the circuit uh, and it would take them to some far flung places back <laughs> in the 1980s and 90s. Um, but the first time that there was tinkering with that number was after the Federalists and John Adams were defeated by the Republicans and Thomas Jefferson, that they tried to lower the number on the court to make sure that Jefferson would not get an appointment. Well, as soon as the Jefferson and his colleagues got in power, they immediately shifted that back to six. We also had a time where President Lincoln was very upset with the Supreme Court for the Dred Scott decision. And he uh, and his uh, members of Congress increased the number of justices to so that President Lincoln could appoint people. Then President Lincoln's assassinated Andrew Johnson as the president. And boy, the uh, Lincoln Republicans did not like Andrew Johnson. So they cut back the number of people. And then when Ulysses Grant was president, they increased the number 
uh, again to, to nine and pretty much it stayed there ever since. Although Franklin Delano Roosevelt did attempt to add justices, but even though he was a very popular president with a big uh, majority in Congress, this was considered a bad idea. And I think it is a bad idea, frankly, to tinker with the, the nine we have. Now as, but it's clearly within the constitution to allow Congress to decide that. Not so clear about term limits uh, because the constitution says that federal judges are appointed uh, for lifetime terms. During their good behavior, they hold their office. And uh, if you're appointed as a Supreme Court justice saying you keep your job, but we're gonna put you on a circuit court, that may not fly. That may require a constitutional amendment. Senator Dingra, what do you think of some of these uh, structural changes that may be coming um, in the next few months in a, in a different in a different Congress? Do you, you like know, the idea? I, I um, a part of me does because I really, really worry about reproductive health uh, in this country as well as uh, what's going to happen with gerrymandering. On the other hand, you know where where does this end? If you keep making these kinds of changes, um, really, what are we saying? And I think what we're saying is we're taking a branch of government that has normally stayed, been apolitical, we want it to be apolitical, and really politicizing it. And so I really worry about our partisan politics coming into um, the, judi the judicial system. And, you know, I've been a prosecutor for 19 years. And one of the things I loved about what Dan Satterberg did uh, once he was a prosecutor is um, run to make it a nonpartisan position. And so I really do hope that there is some sanctity to law and justice when it comes to resolving um, issues that really impact all our lives. I wanna get into that a little more in a little bit here, but first, um, Judge Lasnik, you said that you're against these changes I didn't really hear so much as to why it, it's it's for the same reason uh, the senator's saying you know it gets it too political, or you like the number and silly me I thought that the um, perhaps I thought that the reason the the um, the numbers had been changed earlier had to do with workload, uh, not always political but I guess it's political. Well, it did a little bit at the beginning when they added uh, what manifest destiny, we added states, we added circuits, and the, the number of justices was increased uh, back then. But uh, most of them were very political. And uh, as the Senator said, we would like to keep the third branch as apolitical as possible. And uh, if we get into this battle of, well, you increased it from nine to 11, because you were so upset about Merrick Garland and the Justice Ginsburg position, when we get back in power, we're gonna increase it to 13 and it becomes ridiculous. So uh, I think we have functioned for a long time with nine uh, and um, I believe that it, it's the right number. Let's get the politics out of this as much as possible. And both sides uh, definitely have some blame here. Uh, and, and let's get back to the idea that if you're qualified on the merits as a judge or justice, you'll be confirmed by the Senate. How would we, uh, Judge Lasnik, how would we even pull off term limits? Can you legally kick someone off the Supreme Court, have a survivor kind of session? Or would it likely be, if, if, if this happened, and I know that you both are, are not favorable toward it, but uh, would it be new justices going forward? In my understanding, don't these jobs, they have jobs for life, right? Yes, they do. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, and uh, that you can't tinker with that without a constitutional amendment. But if they, there were a constitutional amendment, it would have to be prospective, not retrospective. That makes sense. Uh, Senator, the, the health care law comes before the high court November 10th. Uh, people with pre-existing conditions are, are pretty worried. Should they be? Uh, they should absolutely be worried. I think for states that have not already codified a lot of the protections of, um, you know, the ACA or Obamacare, I think people use that interchangeably, they should be very worried about that. They should also be very worried about um, having a cap on total spending 
and a lot of the protections that we have now gotten used to. I will say for Washingtonians, we actually have codified those. So, you know, we in Washington are going to be okay and we don't have to worry about pre-existing conditions. We don't have to worry about having a cap on lifetime uh, expenses. What we do have to worry about is absolutely the federal subsidies that the state was making use of um, to help pay for health care that will go away. What we also have to worry about is um, also the increase and expansion of faith-based uh, health care providers. And when that happens, and as it has been happening in the state of Washington recently with the Virginia Mason um, merger with um, uh, Chief Franciscan, is you know end of life decisions and uh, reproductive health are impacted. So we still have healthcare deserts in the state of Washington, and we should be looking towards removing barriers to accessing, not adding more barriers. Well, Governor Inslee uh, saw him quoted in the, in the Seattle Times this week saying that if the high court does strike down the ACA or any parts of it, that he wants Washington to offer something itself. Uh, for, for sort of a more comprehensive approach. Do you know about that? And what would the legislature do? What are they yeah. talking about doing? Yes, um, actually last year in 2019, uh, we in Washington uh, did something that you're hearing about in the national conversation now about a public option and it's called Cascade Care. So this is a public option that's available to all Washingtonians regardless of income. And these are for individuals who are not covered by an employer and this is just another option that's on the market. Enrollment for that is supposed to start this November and uh, coverage will begin in January. And the other thing that we did last year is actually set up a work group that is going to study and take a look at how we can have a pathway to universal health care in the state of Washington. So that report is due to the legislature uh, on November 15th. And so it will outline step by step how the state of Washington can actually go to a universal health care model. So for Washingtonians, we are actually in a really good place to lead in these efforts. Uh, judge Lasnik, a federal judge in our state in Eastern Washington blocked post office changes that were slowing the mail delivery. A lot of people worried about this in terms of, you know, a fair election. You know, Washington's been doing vote by mail for a long time, so the worry is not so much about our own state. But without speaking to the merits of this case, how much will this decision really change how the post office operates? And would it be in time uh, for the looming election? There's some appeals and things possible? Well, uh, Chief Judge Bastian uh, in, in Yakima granted a preliminary injunction that's very broad in what it covers and nationwide. So it will have a dramatic impact on um, some of the moves that the post office was making, which uh, seemed to be designed to not deliver the mail. Uh, and um, yeah, it wasn't too cool to see those mailboxes going by on the trucks. It's like, where the, are they going? <laughs> and the trucks were told to leave on time, regardless of whether they were they were empty, uh, because the mail had not yet been put in there. So. Uh, Chief Judge Bastian made some very strong findings uh, that uh, there were 14 states that came together to, to file this lawsuit. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, wonderfully argued by the Solicitor General of the state of Washington, Franklin High graduate Noah Purcell. He and, is indeed a Franklin High graduate. I, and I think I, that, uh, it, you know, it, it can be appealed to the Ninth Circuit or, or to the U.S. Supreme Court, but I'm sure it has uh, had a, a very strong immediate impact. So, uh, Senator Dingra, what is your take on a, a new Supreme Court's possible impact on voting rights? You know, I really worry about um, voting rights and redistricting with uh, the expansion, with our new um Supreme Court Justice. I think what's happened recently with the Supreme Court um, refusing to really take a look at the gerrymandering that's happened, especially in Wisconsin, those are recent um, case law on that, have been really concerned. I mean, the new requirement is that you have to show intentional 
uh, discrimination, which as we know is going to be close to impossible. Uh, you know, we really have to take a look at the impacts that gerrymandering has been having in so many of these different states. You know, we had, um, I think the Wisconsin example was where um, I think uh, the Supreme Court had said that they don't have the power to review gerrymandering maps. And this is a state where Republicans got less than half of the overall votes uh, for state assembly races, but wound up controlling almost two thirds of the seats. You know, if anyone who looks at that data is gonna say, well, there's something fishy going on. And for a Supreme Court to say that uh, this is not something we're gonna look at is, is highly problematic. And again, it goes down to things like, you know, uh, states like Ohio have the rule that says that if you have skipped a few elections, they're going to remove you from the uh, voter rolls. Again, that's very confusing, uh, horrible, because we're moving to a system that says, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that is not what, um, you know, having one person, one vote means. So I am very concerned about that, and especially as, as how that trickles down to uh, the states. And as we know, a lot of the policies that finally our federal government ends up passing are developed at the state level. They see what states are doing. And when you have a few states that have enacted certain policies, they're working well, that's when the federal government many times or Congress will take those um, laws up. But the disparities within all our states are becoming, um, you know, the difference is becoming wider and wider. So we have an audience question from Renee for Judge Lasnik. So this isn't fair, but have you read the uh, Yale Law Journal article by Epson Sitterman? I know I mangled that for reform to keep the court from being so partisan, uh, which is something we're all kind of touching on a little bit here. No, I haven't read that article, but I, I would point out this is a, a the, today is the first Monday in October. So the U.S. Supreme Court started their arguments today and the case that they were dealing with today out of Delaware. Um, Delaware said, okay, we want to have an even balance of Republican judges and Democratic judges on our Supreme Court. And so we're going to pass a law that says the Democrats get one, the Republicans get one, and so on and so forth. So we have a fairer balanced court. And somebody is challenging that as violating the First Amendment because it doesn't leave any space for an independent or a person I from see. a third party to uh, to be appointed uh, a justice, and it's all appointed in, in Delaware. So it'll be interesting to see how the U.S. Supreme Court, which is being accused of being the Republican appointees are over here, the Democratic appointees are over there, uh, will they say, oh, no, that, that, that can't happen? Or will they say, well, actually, that might not be a bad idea going forward? Interesting case, but I haven't read that law review article, sorry. Uh, Judge Lasnik, um, I wanted to ask you, I actually want to ask you both, but I'm going to start with you, Judge Lasnik, about the tone of public discourse today. And you both touched on it earlier, but kind of this loss of civility, how does that affect even the judicial system? Oh, it's very sad, but I'll tell you, in the courtroom, there's been no loss of civility. The lawyers are still respect the rules of professional conduct. It's much more when the politicians start attacking the judges, uh, calling them so-called judges. Uh, that's a good distinction. Okay, yeah. that's, yeah, very good. And, and, and it's also, uh, or a Mexican judge with uh, Judge Curiel in the Southern District of California. That's really unfortunate because we are um, all United States judges and we deserve respect, not, not to say we can't be criticized, but criticize my decision, don't criticize um, whether I'm, uh, what my ethnic heritage is, what my religion is, what my gender is, or anything like that. And, and I think that that's very, very unfortunate. But make no mistake about it, if you were to go into uh, courtrooms in King County Superior Court or uh, U.S. District Court in the state of uh, Washington, Western or Eastern District, you would not see disrespect of judges or you would not see disrespect of the system. And when you talk to jurors who serve, they come away with a great deal of respect for the justice system. Uh, Senator Dingra, the same question. Um, the overall tone, you, you brought it up a little bit earlier, the overall tone of politics today. 
You have any thoughts about how we could make it a little more civil? Well, I have so many thoughts on this journey, especially <laughs> when it relates, uh, relates to the judiciary. Um, you know, I do hold this, this third branch as sacred and uh, must be the lawyer in me, but I do have high expectations of it. And what I've seen in Washington for the last few years is actually the judicial races being very political. And uh, it was actually brought to me, um, I, Judge um, uh, Shaw's race. He was the first South Asian uh, Superior Court judge in King County. And the amount of money and the, uh, that went into um, having our people of color judges, when they're running, the opposition they face is so uh, dramatic as opposed to our white judges. And you see it over and over again, especially even at our Washington State Supreme Court level. So I do see politics seeping into the judicial races that wasn't there about 10 years ago. I will say at um, the federal level too, I was, I was actually a little heartened uh, to see what uh, John Roberts, uh, Justice uh, Roberts had done. There were a few cases where I think it could have been extremely political but uh, there were three that stood out to me where the Supreme Court upheld some of the ACA provisions um, around choice. We had DACA that was preserved. We had the um, law, uh, uh, the case around LGBTQ rights. And that gave me hope that there was still this sacred judicial uh, integrity because of those decisions. So I really do hope that we can continue to see that. Um, I do think with the passing of Justice Ginsburg, I am not as optimistic that we will continue to see that level of just integrity in our judicial system. I think we will get more political. Uh, I think the same goes to what's been going on with our US attorney's offices and um, the FBI. But I'm very hopeful that we can kind of roll that back and really bring that law and justice and that integrity and accountability that people associate with America, that no matter who you are, you are going to be held accountable for your actions. So the optimist in me is, is slightly optimistic when it comes to the, uh, the other agencies we have, but with the Supreme Court, this is again where I don't know if we're gonna see some of the cases and the decisions that were made um, that provided that judicial integrity anymore. Judge Lasnik, uh, you told me that you recently completed your first Zoom trial. What were some of the limits uh, of the technology, or did it just did it just go smoothly? It Zoom really is the future, uh, except for a couple of times when the judge had muted and forgot and started talking. Uh, <laughs> it can happen to anyone, but uh, you know it was a very uh, complicated trial involving. Um, uh, a child who was born with serious uh, defects. And I had experts from all over the country who were able to testify from their uh, office or from their den. Uh, they didn't have to fly. So, so Zoom, like it does in other things, you can bring in you know, guests from all over because of the easy access. So maybe it has that plus, right? It, it actually did. And it was a bench trial to me, so we didn't have to worry about the jury situation. But Judge Zilly, my colleague, is doing a Zoom jury trial as we speak oh, uh, wow. in like day five or six, uh, where the jurors uh, uh, and all the parties and the judge are all appearing through Zoom. Now, we can't do that in criminal because of the confrontation clause unless there are waivers. Uh, but uh, Judge Zilly reports that the Zoom trial is going very well. And my, my trial, I was very surprised. Uh, it went very, very well. So, uh, you know, we're the, we in the judiciary are the last ones to change anything. But this necessity was the mother of invention for us. And I don't think we'll ever go completely back to the old system. And the legislature, Senator Dingra, is going to be a little virtual or medium virtual. Can you explain that? Yes, um, you know, I actually am very excited about what's going on with a criminal justice system and, and the court system and using technology and seems going to be true of the legislature. Uh, we cannot be business as usual because of COVID. So we are looking at a hybrid model, uh, seeing how we, right now we are doing our committee hearings uh, virtually. 
So, and those have been going well, but we still have to figure out how we're gonna do voting and how we're gonna um, you know, manage uh, public input. So there's a lot of practicing going on and thinking through things and developing ideas, but we do have to be creative. But I will say to um, the judge's point is I am actually very excited to look at legislation that helps codify some of um, the new practices that uh, have been going on. You know, one of the things around especially domestic violence protection orders, the manner in which we've been allowing for electronic filing, uh, making uh, changes to uh, serving of those orders. Um, I am very excited to hear from some of the prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges that in cases where they have been doing voir dire for juries uh, virtually, they have seen a much more diverse jury pool than when people appear in person. Uh, Another both, plus then, right? Yeah, so there and are I have to, and, and I have, that have come out of this. A lot of, yes. And I have to leave it right there because we have been discussing the pending confirmation of a new Supreme Court justice and its impact on our state with State Senator Monka Dingra and Federal District Judge Robert Lasnik. Up next, you've probably heard that Seattle has been labeled an anarchist city. We're coming back shortly to discuss the media's role in our stranger and stranger national reputation. And we are back. Civic Cocktail rolls onward. I am here this evening with Omari Salisbury, founder of Converge Media, and Ted Warren, staff photographer for the Associated Press in Seattle. Thank you both so much for joining us. You know, Seattle has gone from America's most livable city and the top city for business to a place the president and the attorney general of the United States describe as lawless, even an anarchist city. Omari Salisbury, what do you make of Seattle's new reputation as a sort of urban hellscape? <laughs> well, first of all, what an introduction and a first question. Uh, well, I, you know, I think it's it's inaccurate. You know, and, and one of the things that we we've seen probably for the last uh, four months here is a lot of sens uh, sensationalized media coming coming out of Seattle. Um, That's why you know, you're we, here tonight. Right. We, you know, we definitely have our problems and issues and things like that. But um, you know, to, to to paint the whole city with this broad brush is disingenuous and misleading. Ted Warren, your thoughts on this? You look through your camera. Is that what you saw when you looked through the camera, an urban hellscape, a no, lawless I, city? I think a big part of the problem is, is that national uh, media or people who aren't in person able to take a look at what was happening took some very factual reporting and pictures and video and tended to stereotype or try and lump one particular action by a very small group of people into a really broad uh, brush of what the entire city was. And in some cases, they took just what was happening in a few blocks and tried to apply it to up to 20% of the city of Seattle. And it, I think that's a good example of... Oh, that is a good example. I mean, what was the landmass of uh, CHOP or jazz, which, whichever term you want to use? Was it less than 1% of the city? I mean, it's six blocks, in, you know, like all together. I don't, I don't know how that fits in the eighty-eight square miles by percentage, but I mean, it was it's, it's, six it's blocks. A, it's less than one percent. Um, and, and so you know, let's let's get into some of that. To both of you, you know, what role did the media play in this, in this impression of us? Um, you you go first on this, Ted. I would say that, you know, there there were several things that. <clears throat> And when I say the media, it's very difficult because we're not really all organized together and we're not doing the same thing. But some of the negative things about Seattle that were reported, um, in, in addition to what I mentioned already, overestimating the area that was involved in that, there were also some assumptions that every single person protesting and demonstrating for the cause uh, was violent or that every single protester was out to light fires and break things. And, and that was a tiny, tiny minority. Um, and in some cases, people who weren't directly doing so because of, 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 of the cause that was there. Um, I think the media also um, is guilty sometimes of letting police speak on behalf of the protesters 
and perhaps the other way around, where they take everything they think that they know about protesters from things that the police say. And that, in my case, when I go out, even though I'm primarily a photographer, I'm trying to talk to a lot of people. I'm trying to ask them why they're there and, and, and what they're doing in, or, in order to inform my pictures better. And I think that needed to be done uh, quite a bit more by national media who was trying to paint this into one particular action or you know, type of situation. Well, they, the, some of these images were so um, directly, you know, just misleading. You know, uh, this happened to probably everybody who knows somebody from another city, <clears throat> whatever media they're watching, you know, you get these text messages, are you okay? I live near Seward Park. So I just walked down and took this picture of the water and a couple of sailboats and sent that and said, I seem to be fine. You know, just this gorgeous picture from down there. But Omar, I'd ask you that, um, the local media, just watching the local media, you were so uh, involved and so, so intrepid in your reporting throughout this. Did you did you see local media? Do you have an example of a local media person who kind of just hyped it, got it wrong, took it to the limit that it didn't need to well, go to? Well, I mean, so it, it was it was a lot going on, and I I just wanted to point out to a few things here where 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 the where the people really where local media really kind of might have got it wrong initially was that they took everything that SPD said for as as truth. You know, SPD would say this happened, and then the local media would run with it, and then we'd have a camera on the ground that might not necessarily show something totally different, you know, that that was uh, un unfolding or occurring. I mean, that pink umbrella incident is is a perfect example, you know, Tell SPD us about the out, pink um, umbrella incident. Yeah, the, that was that was a flashpoint. It was June 1st. And, you know, I, I was there. A lot of people, they they know that footage uh, right there on the on the Western Barricade. Tell us about barricade. the footage. Not everybody knows. Sure. It. OK, well, it was right there on the Western Barricade. Um, you know, and we call it the Western Barricade because it was the barricade west of the East Precinct on Pine Street. And you had protesters on one side of the barricade and the police right on the other, just a few feet from each other um, across the barricade. And, um, you know, with, uh, what happened was, is that the flashpoint was, is that an officer grabbed a pink umbrella from a protester and they start fighting over the umbrella, pulling each other <laughs> back and forth. And then literally all hell broke loose. But the, the SPD had put out um, a statement saying that protesters started a riot. And it wasn't until like, you know, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't hear the riot talk until hours later, even the next morning. And we thought it was something different because we were like, man, there's a riot going on. You know, like we were just there. It, where's the riot? Uh, and it, you know, it turns out that like the next day, then people looked at this footage even later on that night, and it was like, oh, well, actually, this whole thing started when an officer pulled an umbrella. I mean, another example of that is when the police, June 8th, when the Seattle Police Department uh, abandoned the East Precinct. I was there on the ground. Seattle Police Department said that they were just reducing their footprint and, you know, they were, they were, they were still operating. I'm there. I see them putting up boards, putting up fencing. And I'm on Twitter saying as Seattle Police Department is evacuating, they're abandoning. And a lot of the local media pushed back on me initially because it's like, no, Seattle Police Department says they're just reducing their footprint. And so, you know, I just turn on my camera and go live. I'm like, yo, well, they're definitely moving out. There's moving trucks and everything else. But the biggest thing of where I think um, local media just kind of jumped on something was where they retweeted this tweet where you know, there was like 30 different chop accounts. Everybody made some chop account. And there was also a whole nother story. There was a lot of foreign governments and all kinds of stuff when chop was going on. It was a big misinformation campaign, well beyond just your local people. But anyway, there was a chop account that said the chop was over with and it was dismantling and everything. And I was out there on the ground and this is, it wasn't even local media, but also national media. And I'm telling the, the some of the local people as well as national broadcasters, like, listen, this chop, isn't folding up. It's not going anywhere. I've been here for like, you know, 20 some odd days. It, it's, you know, what you've got is false information. And even though I'd been on the ground, knew all the players there and everything else, and I'm telling them that this was a fake tweet or fake news, they still all went live and said that the chop was, was, was closing up. Um, and, you know, and, and actually, the end result of that is really the energy behind the chop was winding down that day. You know, the previous days it was winding down, but that running with that fake news 
uh, energized the chop. It, it brought people back into the chop. And so we saw firsthand that people like, you know, to push the story, just disregarded the facts that they were on the ground and disregarded people who were experts on the ground. You know, we were totally disregarded. We, we tried to tell people what the what was going on, uh, but it was more important to just get their story out. Yeah. So uh, maybe one of the b best known examples of the media getting it wrong, and I mean, it sounds like intentionally wrong, is the Fox News reports. And Ted, you're a photographer and you've looked at the images and you, had, you were there on the scene as well. Can you sort of explain to us how Fox News did that? They digitally altered photos and changed the story that they were sending out of what actually was happening. Yeah, this was on the uh, Fox News national website and they took still photographs that um, were taken by a couple of good friends of mine and colleagues, um, primarily David Ryder, who was shooting for Reuters and also Karen Ducey, who was shooting for Zuma. And they took these pictures and combined them with Photoshop. Um, the primary image was a picture of a um, member of the volunteer security um, in the CHOP zone who they did carry um, in, in accordance with open carry laws, um, very large guns. And one of them was standing in front of a car when his picture was taken by David. But the people at the National Fox News website took that photo, cut it out, and put it in front of a composite of two different pictures of downtown Seattle where windows had been broken and looting had been taking place. So they literally took this guy who was in the chop and put him downtown uh, days and days apart as a composite image. They also took him and put him in front of the entrance as if he was standing there by the sign that says, welcome to CHOP, saying, hey, don't come here. I've got this gun and we're guarding it. And, and that's completely false from what was happening. Um, the third thing that happened on that same website is there was a, a headline that said Seattle in flames or something like that with um, a picture of a big fire and a guy running past a fire and kind of a protest situation that was taken in St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> and so all these things were put together to make whoa. Seattle look whoa, whoa, like it whoa. was, you know, yeah. overrun. And uh, uh, that, that was through computers. And any time that you question or take away from the truth that is a photograph, because it's a, it's a carbon copy of what's in front of your eyes, anytime you violate that, it's a huge erosion of trust. And we take that extremely seriously. And I remember it was uh, my former colleague at the Seattle Times, Jim Bruner, who broke that story about this digitally altering these photos. So Amari, you mentioned a little bit about social media, but overall, I guess, did, did social media help or hurt uh, the image of this city or, or around the country, I guess, around the world? Well, you know, I mean, so social media is, social media is just a medium. Um, you know, what, what really hurt the city is people who, who had their own agenda either way, you know, and they use social media as the tool. Social media is definitely not the enemy of anybody. It's the people who are pushing the messaging. And, you know, I mean, it was just a lot of people who had different agendas. They, they've already had agendas well before CHOP and this created an opportunity for them to be able to, to, to push that. You know, I mean, one of the things where our, our stream really took off and I didn't realize it until after the fact, so many people would be like, hey, you know, my, my mom lives in South Carolina or my, 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 my dad lives in Maine and they watch your stream because they hear all these things on the news and they're able to watch your stream because, you know, I would walk the chop a few times a day. We have morning, midday and night. I would just walk and show people, you know, what's going on out there. Did you stay overnight and in the chop? I lived in the chop for 30 days. I wasn't, I, but, but I wasn't in the tent though. We, we, we happened to have an office that was right there. It was a temporary space right there next to the East precinct. So I was literally in the chop for 30 days. You know, every day I was, I was on the ground. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, what, what we saw was that people were able to just make up anything and run with it. And, and I was telling Ted before that the AP actually one time called me just so they could myth bust because there were so many myths that were out there about what was going on. And I would sit on the phone with the AP and tell them like, no, that's not true. That's not true. This is true. Um, and, and so, you know, so, social media, 
just exposed people's true agendas about our, our city and how they feel about the city. I think that, you know, that that's what occurred. So Ted, you have some photos lined up that you're gonna share with us and show us uh, some things that you took, you some photos you took that you found compelling uh, during those protests. Um, mm -hmm. You ready to go, can do share screen and show us, show us some of your work, please. Okay. Uh, let me know when they're up. I believe they're, uh, Norm's going to put them up. If I'm correct. There you go. There okay. you go. Are they up? Yep. Okay. So this first picture is um, a picture of the same uh, volunteer security person who was the, the famous one in the manipulation. But this was a real picture um, that I took of him. And this was actually the, the morning after one of the deaths that happened near uh, the chop. And so we were there because of this situation. And it's important, uh, Omari and myself and anyone else who was trying to accurately report from the scene, we're not trying to hide or, or diminish anything. I have no agenda being there. I'm going to be there to show whatever is happening. And so this was this guy was on patrol. He's carrying his gun, um, but it is in a real situation. It's where he was at that time, and the caption talked about what he was doing, and and we felt that that was important um, to show that that was an aspect, um, both that they felt they needed that type of security there, and that how people would react to that type of security walking around. Next photo. Oh, Second oh, picture. Yeah. Um, this was real important to me, and, and I noticed really late in the game, you can even see Omari in the background doing his stream right in the middle above the guy in the orange shirt. So that shows he was really there all the time. And I appreciated getting to know him um, during my coverage. But there's a lot of times when people are protesting that kind of the general public's impression is, oh, they don't even know why they're protesting. Why, and, you know, they, they just want to be out there yelling and, and, and in the streets and they really don't know, but there were multiple places all during the duration of the chop zone where they had their demands posted. They had them posted on fences around Cal Anderson Park. They had them posted on these barricades and it was really clear. These were the three, among the three main goals, the main uh, demands of the people who were protesting and occupying this area. And I felt it was really important to publish those to show people here was three things that they were working for. And certainly there were other issues, there were other opinions, there were other demands, but these three things were there. And so I felt it was important to publish a picture like this on, on multiple occasions to show people that they, the, these people did have a focus with what they were trying to accomplish. And then this third picture is from uh, later in the summer. This was from July 25th and Omari was here on this day also. Um, and it's just, it's more of a standard um, confrontational picture of protesters with umbrellas, um, Black Lives Matter signs um, being pepper sprayed um, by the police and other law enforcement who were there. Um, and again, it's, an, it's important to show this because this was happening uh, day in and day out. This was happening in July when the, the initial confrontations were months earlier and it was still ongoing and, 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 and still a problem. Um, and this also shows some of the challenges that we have in trying to report this and staying safe ourselves, hopefully out of tear gas range. Uh, I did a little better job of that than Omari, I believe. Uh, but <laughs> the, 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 the challenge of trying to show what is going on and still being able to keep ourselves safe. Thank you so much for those, Ted. Um, we have an audience question from Supraja. It's for both of you. We'll start with you, Omari. Um, is there a local or global media ethics oversight committee that you would say journalists today feel they want to try being accountable to? And this person says, I have seen stilted coverage and there's really no authority to report that to? Shouldn't this change? What well, do you I mean, you know, for, for me, I'd, I'd have some discussions about media and how people are viewing things and everything else. And I mean, you know, people holding to an ethical code is important. But you know what I would tell people, they'd be like, oh, I looked at this channel and they say this, this and that. 
I'm like, there's no, there's no time on history in the history of mankind where there's more information that's out there. I challenge people who consume content to diversify your content stream, man, you know, turn the channel, go to the different website, look for some things. I mean, you know, people sit and they watch one channel or one blog or one website, and then they make these assumptions. If you want to really be informed, then it's on you. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's not the media's job to, 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 you know, to, to inform you What's on all like aspects. A, yeah. I mean, you, you rat have on, to get rat on, on a colleague. Is that what you right. mean? Well, no, but what, 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 what I'm saying is, is like people, people, people were going about thinking that one media channel is the end all or one website is the end all. It's like, man, you have so many choices that are out there. You have to get off your butt and you have to be able to find the, the different media outlets that are out there and find balance in the stories. You know, I always look for three or four different outlets on a story, just me personally. Um, you know, so I kind of take a different approach that I say the people who consume news need to work harder at finding different sources. But I do think that like, you know, I mean, ethical standards are definitely important. And these days, clearly ethical standards have been blown to the wind. What do you say, Ted? Um, I, I want to point out that um, there's, there's a couple of answers to this. Uh, I'm a staffer with Associated Press and at our website, which is ap.org. It's very easy. Under the about section, we state our company news values and principles right there. Yep. And it's, uh, we, the, the, those are held and discussed and enforced to us, um, no matter how many years you've worked there, uh, very, very strongly. And that guides our coverage as an organization and as individual journalists. Um, for photos, there's organizations such as the National Press Photographers Association, um, there's the Pointer Institute, there's the Knight Foundation, there are some journalists um, organizations that will help, you know, develop standards and set standards. Uh, but one of the important things about our free press is we don't have a regulatory agency other than the people that we serve to police us or to to crack down or say what you're doing is fair or accurate or not. It's up to public opinion and public comment and social media. All of those things, I think, while they create a lot of noise, also do help keep things in check in, in ways that we, we weren't able to do um, years ago. And so I hold myself accountable first to those news values and principles, uh, but I also hold myself accountable to people who view my pictures, who make comments on them um, in social media or, or reach out through emails. And I try and tell the truth through that lens to, it, to be accountable um, to them. Um, I totally agree with what Amari said, to diversify yourself, read a lot, look at different outlets, look at different reporting, and hopefully form your own opinions from that. Right. So Omari, our standards, uh, oh, I was going to say our, our standards and, and ethics are, are up on our website as well. Uh, just, just following up on that. Oh, fair. Totally fair. So Omari, the public, especially in Seattle, enthusiastically supported the protests, June, July. But after a while, there was some destruction. There was a little bit of violence uh, and, and support kind of waned. So I'm wondering, um, do you think that's fair that that happened, that the support seemed to decline a little bit? Man, well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, this is this is a Seattle thing, uh, being that the black community has consistently been protesting and, you know, they've been out there every day. Uh, Africa town does stuff in the central district, thousands of people. You get you get Coach Dom, Community Passageways, Willard, Willard Jimerson, United Bear thinking out there at the south end, thousands of people come out. No police, no destruction, no anything, you know, and, and black people are in their community and they're protesting, they're doing teach-ins and everything else and nobody cares. You know, I mean, where's the enthusiastic support for, for the black people that are, that are rallying all the time? Seattle doesn't care. But when, when the, basically the white kids 
are up there on Capitol Hill, then Seattle has this overwhelming love for protests and everything else, you know, and this overwhelming love is now Wayne. So I see, I, you know, a lot of people might see it from just one lens and they, they, they see the lens of what happens on mainstream media. In mainstream media, they're showing them Capitol Hill, what's going on there. Black people have been peacefully protesting, doing the teachings, learnings, rallies, concerts, everything else, and nobody cares. So when you say that Seattle has been in love with the protests, they ain't been in love with black folks. They've been in love with the white people that they see up on Capitol Hill protesting. So I just want to be clear with that. You know what I'm saying? Let's, That's let's fair. be no, honest. No, you're fair. You're fair. Uh, and I want to take a, a, another step here. And this is something you and I spoke about when we were prepping for this show. You said that the protests are winding down now for an actually very positive reason, that they got results. Well, you know, I mean, people, believe me, the people, they're still out there in the streets. They're the morning march, the Absolutely. evening march, and everything else. But what I was saying is that in, in Seattle, unlike a lot of other cities, a lot of other cities, you know, protest was out there for a few weeks and it hit its expiration date. In Seattle, whether you like it or not, or whether you agree with this movement or not, in 90 days, you know, 100 days, it went from a, the Western barricade to legislation in, in city hall, city council. They put up something, they voted, the mayor vetoed it, they overrided a veto and, you know, and they've moved on. There's nowhere else in America. This is warp speed. Whether, whether you're uh, with this movement or against this movement, Seattle is something that's very unique. And, you know, I mean, people, a lot of people will tell you who are in that movement is the fact that people never left the streets in Seattle one way or another, and they've maintained the pressure on city council and city hall is why things are moved. The, the mayor just did an executive order on, on you know, last week on, on policing and all these other things are happening here. And, you know, it's, it's happening very rapidly in Seattle, unlike almost anywhere else in America, um, probably because people are in the streets and it's the, it's the right mix. There's other cities where people are in the streets, but things aren't really happening in city hall. And then there's other cities where people just knew nothing was going to happen. And so they, they processed it for five days and life moved on. Seattle is very unique. Ted, I would ask you, do you have enough information? Did you see enough through your camera lens to know uh, what was the difference, say, between Seattle's protests and Portland's? Do you have a sense of that? It's, uh, it's a little tough for me to answer that because I haven't been down to Portland to see it for myself. Um, I, I did notice when I would cover a protest, and it, this has been brought up about Portland, when there's a heavy police protest, even before the thing starts, and, and when even the people who are getting ready to start a march, if they're met with a very heavy, aggressive police protest, it tends to escalate things on both sides. And I've seen that in what I've seen in Portland, where there's some nights where there's there's nothing, there's no pushback, and they're, they're having uh, even, even slightly humorous things like dance parties or something like that. Other times it turns violent night after night after night. I can't speak to which side is uh, causing that, but from what I did see in Seattle is that when that presence is there, when that pushback is there, sometimes just on can we march up to this block or not, whether there's uh, and, and there's not destruction going on, that tends to to escalate things. So I think with with the, there still has been unfortunately damage and vandalism um, in Seattle as recently as last Saturday. Um, we're not completely through with it. But as far as the every single day clashes that are happening in Portland, um, I, I can't give an exact answer to that. But my observation of what I've seen here, perhaps that is a factor in it. Uh, Omar, I want to go back uh, to almost the beginning of, of the protests. Your role, at least early on, I think it was day two for you. I forget which day you said, but early on, uh, you started um, tweeting, hashtag calm it down. And we've been talking about, you know, we're all journalists, we try to be detached. Um, it's a great sentiment, absolutely. It's a great sentiment. But um, it, it, tell me about it. It's, 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 uh, it doesn't really fit into being the detached journalist as well as some of the other stuff. Well, well, Twitter, tw me, Twitter, and Mayor Durkin, we, we, we've got a relationship that, a, a few times where we pulled out the Twitter machine um, one time was when the chop got cleared and they tried to clear all the media and I was the only media person in there. But the, 
the the issue you're talking about is we're covering the the western barricade and the the tear gas came out in so disproportionately what we got to remember is that the the police police as a whole and seattle police department that came out and reports they're not man their 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 skills at crowd control against a protest when the protest is against them man it's it, they've got a ways to go and they put out so much tear gas that as a citizen of Seattle, man, yeah, journalists, what as a citizen, I was like, man, this this ain't right. And so I got on 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 Twitter. I told people on the live stream, the only person who could stop this is the mayor. You know, everybody tweet Mayor Durkin, hashtag calm it down, calm it down, because this is it, it was incomprehensible that here in this residential area, smoke everywhere, tear gas. I mean everywhere that the only thing that i could really think of was like man who can stop this right now the only person who can stop it is the mayor and hashtag calm it down and man thousands of people hopped on and started tweeting the mayor thank you for that uh we have been talking about seattle's image as an anarchist city with omari salisbury of converge media and ted warren of the associated press Civic Cocktail leads off a very busy week in politics. We have the vice presidential and gubernatorial debates midweek. We are back in November with a post-election show. Thank you so much for joining us and good night.